Hey everyone, happy to have you here for another episode of Legacy Matters. Today, as usual, we will talk about whatever comes up with a slight leaning toward discussions of preserving your legacy, preparing for things to come, and sharing stories we find amusing. It drags on sometimes. Oh, does it? It does, yes. Our introduction. <laughs> well, yeah. I, have, I have started recording. So. Okay, well, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday morning. Hey, Jim. Hey, Sam. Sarah is not with us uh, today. Oh, don't say it that way. That sounds... She's still with us, but she's well, not she's in the still studio with us. With yeah, us. she's not dead yet. <laughs> um, Jim and Sarah have this morbid morbid uh, fascination with death and, and talking about death. I love yeah. it. Well, because like, it's Who's going to die first? Right. Well, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, actually. It's a toss-up between me and Sarah, I think. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you know? Oh, Jim. <laughs> Just, All right. Well, uh, just saying. for for those uh, who uh, have, it'll take, be me. Yeah. Well, I mean, we all assume that, but I'm older. The little rhino but, over there will live on, though. Um, for those of us uh, who have joined us here on the podcast, y- you found your way to us, so it's sort of a little redundant to say thank you and all of that. But let's remind people that uh, there you should have the ability to follow or subscribe. Uh, if you do that, that helps us out. And we still don't have a lot of comments for some reason. And I think it's because it takes a while to, you have to commit yourself to sit down and actually write a comment. I get it. But if you're enjoying the podcast, uh, please do let us know. And if you're not, uh, go ahead and keep those comments to yourself, I guess. There you go. All right. (laughs) No, No, go ahead. Let us have it. Do what you got to do. Uh, we have got a guest. I'm going to let Jim introduce. So we are here with Chris Osgood this morning. Welcome, hi. Chris. Hi there. Nice to be here. Thanks for coming nice in. Nice to have you in. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for those of you who know, so I know, Chris, I mean, you are legendary to, for me here in the Twin Cities. And, and the beginning, you know, for me is uh, the band Suicide Commandos. No. Yeah. That's nice. That's, of that's you. the beginning of it. That's, with you. that's nice of you to say. <laughs> um, I would even go as far as to say that it's not just for Jim. I, you know, I told you I don't do a ton of research, but I did notice that you have a couple of days named after you, which is that's pretty cool. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's because you don't get that for nothing. That's your contribution to our to our team. I think it's because I had so many guitar students, and, yeah. I, and by and large, they think fondly of me. The, so, those students, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Which is, if you're a teacher, that's a nice thing. Yeah, right? that's a right. great thing. Right. I said by and large. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I caught that in there. <laughs> a, hey, uh, there, so there, that means there's a few of them out there who maybe have a, no, a different every, opinion. No, no. Every, every student, but a couple of students' moms and dads didn't, oh. didn't understand my approach. Oh. Oh. There, there was when I used to teach guitar lessons after the commandos went off the road. I started make my, making my living as a composer and uh, writing a ballet a year for Walker Art Center and a thing that I used to do with a, a choreographer and, and the dancers in the community. And it would be a big production that would be whoever wasn't touring at the time, whether it was uh, Tommy Stinson or Slim Dunlap or Chan Poling or whomever would be, we would do it together and I would write the music. and. A friend of mine would choreograph it. And, really? Uh, yeah, so there, I actually did that for a couple of years, but I was teaching guitar. That's the way I really right. made my living in those days. And one day a woman confronted me because her son came home and I hadn't taught her son to play notes on a page. And because uh, what I did at New Coupe, I, I started something called the New Wave Academy of Applied Guitar Sciences. And it started in my apartment. And people like Bob Mould would take the bus over and come up, and we would needle drop. And is this like I, little Bobby Mould? Mm, big Bobby the, Mould. He was big, going. He was going to college at the okay. time. Moved here from New York and was going to McAllister. Okay. And would get off the bus with his flying V case. And if you guys know what a flying V oh, is, I do. <laughs> and would come upstairs, and and my girlfriend at the time would hide in the closet and read books. And when I was teaching. And uh, eventually one thing led to another, and I had so many students that I couldn't do it in my apartment anymore. Right. So I moved into the basement of Newt Coupe and made a deal with them and started um, teaching guitar to, to students. But what I would do is I would teach people how to learn by ear and right. say, These are the, this is how a guitar works, this is the, how to make your way around the neck, start to bring in music that you like, right. and I'll show you how to figure it out, and I'll show you why music theory is important. 
if you're getting into a band and you want to share your ideas with other people, you need to figure out a way to talk to them. And this is an A chord, and this is an E chord, and this is a D chord, and this is a C chord, and so forth. But this woman was upset that her student hadn't come home with any, um, like, notes on a page. Like classic Well, like Twinkle, reading. Twinkle, Little Star, or right. something like that. Right. And I, got, I remember very clearly, I said to her, lady, <laughs> I'm a guitar teacher, not a music teacher. Right, right. And that's where we left Fair off. Fair enough. Yeah. So and her kid grew up to be a great guitar player. Did oh, can no you, thanks to her. <laughs> can, can you mention that? Well, I suppose yeah, you I can, the name. Yeah, I can. Uh, can I mention the person? Yeah, let's call him Paul. All right, fair <laughs> enough. I got that. <laughs> so, Chris, how did you learn how to play? I took guitar <laughs> lessons. I learned how to play "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star." And the Mel Bay version of it was Sparkling Stella because they couldn't, you know, with that the Twinkle Twinkle was copywritten. So oh. they, Mel Bay wrote an approximation. And so I learned some notes and then I learned some chords. And I studied with, um, uh, I should say that I was a piano player before that. And in fourth grade, I had a piano recital that I was apprehensive about. I had to play Peter and the Wolf. Okay. Which goes bum bum ba 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 ba. But your I left, remember that one well yeah. from it. Your, I didn't write that, by the way. But <laughs> your your left hand is doing something different than your right hand, and it happens, they happen slightly out of time with each other. And I said to my mom, you know, the, the recital was coming up the following week, and I said, Mom, I don't think I can play this well enough um, for to do well at the recital. And Mom goes, Oh, sure you can. Let's hear. And so I sat down and played it for her, and she goes, You know. You don't have to do that recital. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for the vote of confidence, Ma. Which, which is probably, Sam, the very thing that led to me being a musician. Because she'd given my dad a guitar that he never played, yeah. a little harmony guitar. And I picked that up. And with a guitar, your right hand and your left hand do more or less the same thing at the same time. Right. They're not, it's not. Out know, of phase. Well, they're, my friend John Sims calls it 10 angry fingers. Mm -hmm. And they're, for me, on a piano, it means that I can make 10 mistakes. But on a guitar, you can only make six mistakes. Okay. Oh. Right? Because there's only six strings. Right. I mean, you could yell and make another mistake. <laughs> sure. Or something like that. But um, for me, the odds got dramatically better with guitar. And, you know, I, I lopped off the chances of making a mistake by four. Right. And uh, you know your right hand and your left hand are just by because of the nature of the instrument they're more um, in sync with each other. Right. And so um, after uh, some some of those early lessons and some lessons with a guy named Jim Parker in uh, junior high, I just started to teach myself how to how to play how to tune up to records, mm -hmm. how to play along with them. You know, and then figure out what the structure was. And structure was pretty simple. You know, anything this side of the Beatles, um, you know, Rolling Stone stuff I could figure out, Kink stuff I could figure out, hmm. the Who stuff I could really figure out. You know, that okay. took about two passes. But in those days, honest to God, I would sit there and wait by my transistor radio for, I can see for miles, to come on. And then I would try and play along with it as well as I could. And then I'd have to wait another two hours. And then, right. they, then they'd play it again. It was, yeah. And I would, you know, eventually I got hip to the rhythms of AM radio. And then FM radio came along. And that was a whole different story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I got a record player and everything got way easier. Yeah, you could Especially you after could you buy that. the records. Right, right. You could the player by itself is pretty useless. Yeah. But... <laughs> Right, you need the records. Yeah. So was your family, so were you the only musical person in the family? Or did well, you my, mom, my mom plays piano. She's still, still um, around and uh, not playing as much as she used to, but, but uh, hmm. we had a piano in the house when I was a kid. I have that piano in my house now, by the way. Okay. Do you play uh, it? Mm-hmm, okay. I do. So you, uh, you still, even though you went from piano to guitar because you dropped four possible mistakes, <laughs> uh, you still stuck with piano well enough to, or uh, well, well, well enough to tinkle. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what I do is I so tinkle. Is your mom proud of you for <laughs> for sticking with it? I mean, yeah, I think yeah. she is. Yeah. So that I, didn't I it didn't is. destroy your ego to be to be told that you couldn't do that in fourth grade or whatever. Did you play the recital? No. After all, no. Okay. Good. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no, I was saved from was the saved. ignominy of it, yeah. and, and thanks to my wonderful mom. Yeah, that's awesome. And that led to a career. Mm-hmm. So, uh, thanks, mom. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> it is. And yeah. there, there's a parenting tip for everybody. I have a I have a twelve year old who uh, he wanted a guitar a couple of years ago. We got it for him. I I don't think I don't think his fingers are quite coordinated enough to make it all work. Mm-hmm. But yet. Uh, yet, but man, that guy sticks with it. Like I I know literally almost zero about music mm-hmm. and how it's made. It's it's some sort of magical mystery that you guys can do that. I I just don't. I can try and follow. I can watch what's going on, and none of it makes any sense to me. Uh, never really has. It's like a foreign language or something. But that guy, my son Tyson, just sticks with it, and I love that. Well, that's when I started to play. Was twelve. Okay. And uh, the more you play, the quicker you get good. So, so you're kind of learning. You're listening to the radio. You're waiting for that next Who mm-hmm. song to come on. Mm-hmm. You know, I can I can picture this. You know, and then you've got your turntable. You're kind of dropping the needle. Yeah, you're needle hearing dropping. that. But you know what I think is interesting about you is that you are you know one of the beginning i mean punk when punk came out i mean the suicide commandos how did that (laughs) how did that like what was the first thing like how did you how did that happen because because you're well let me back up though you're from minnesota correct yep Yep. i grew up in uh i went to elementary school in yz in the same neighborhood as chan polling Okay. Chan and I met when Chan plays in a band called The Suburbs. Yeah. And uh, still does. Mm-hmm. And he met when I was five and he was three. Okay. And uh, <laughs> we've been friends ever since. Wow. Yeah. And, but, you know, we weren't playing music in those days. We were um, skateboarding and, and uh, riding around in their go kart and even not at three and five, but later yeah, on right. in, the, in that neighborhood in YZ. And then after that, I moved to um, Excelsior in uh, sixth grade. And in sixth grade, Casey McPherson, whom I still play with, and Commando Dave All were in my sixth grade class. And Dave and I were skate punks together. We skateboarded uh-huh. before he started playing drums or I started playing guitar. Okay. So we were, we were friends. In, in, I, mean, I mean, we were friends before we were musical colleagues. Right. Or in, in the same band. Okay. All right. But do you want to back up anymore, or should I talk about the Well, origins? what I want to ask you is, how, how did that first sort of punk sound happen? Like, how, how were you influenced? I mean, being it here was, in Minnesota, it, it, you know, how did you, you know, how did it happen? Because you're was, listening to The Who. And, well, and the, well, The Who was as close as I could get yes. to, to primal rock and roll. I mean, that's what I liked. and. There, I went off to college. I went to. I played in a band with Dave, a few bands, Head Blues Band in junior high, and then uh, our friend Carol Flagg joined us. The, my choreographer friend, in fact, and she sang lead vocals, and we were called Souvenir and the Mementos, and we would play <laughs> on the weekends and play like frat parties, and you know, we started off. And playing, where was this? What Minneapolis? In Minneapolis, we, we started playing songs like and we had to. When we joined Schoen Productions in ninth grade, we had to learn Heat Wave and Midnight Hour. And Randy Levy was the guy who owned Schoen in those days, which became Rose. Okay. And Randy said, if you can learn those two songs and put them in your set, I'll start to book you. And so we started to play regularly every weekend when I was starting in 10th grade. So because this is life and legacy and, and we, we love, we do get into... Uh, sort of talking about what was different in different eras. So I'm mm-hmm. picturing, like, so you know I, I told you when you came in that I was born in 75. So I'm trying to picture your, what, late 60s? My world. Early 70s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I've got some some movies I can sort of reference and some history lessons I learned and stuff. But, like, I'm picturing a block of wood with some with some metal wheels on it when you say skateboarding. How big was skateboarding when, when you were... Skateboarding was kind of big. Was but it? it? But it was a block of wood with metal wheels. <laughs> and then, and honestly... Was like, it really? Yeah, right, like roller skate wheels. Yeah. And, then, and then by the time Dave and I got into it, there were skateboard magazines. I right. think it was called Skateboard. Yeah. And wheels had changed. They weren't like the soft kind of wheels that you have now, but they were hard plastic wheels and they were wide. Like mm-hmm. about an inch and a half wide, like ro- like roller skate, kind of like yeah, kind of like, like actually, roller skates same. are now. They were they were really loud. The freeformer. Because what is that? The, the truck or whatever? The like there's a little bit of suspension in the yeah. yeah. Did and they have could, that could, back then? Yeah, you could steer it. You know, okay. there, if you went this way or that way, the front would 
turn, and it was hard plastic, maybe like that one up on the shelf. Yeah. And they were really loud. They sounded like... <laughs> like the wheels on the yeah, pavement? On, on the pavement, yeah. Huh. And, and, and you, said, you said I was learning this stuff listening to AM radio, and then eventually it went to FM. Was, I, I don't know my radio history. Was FM to like to have that just come out? Yeah, no. Yeah, no, FM, FM just started um, in about 1970. Really? That's when KQ came mm-hmm. along. And before that... Tony Glover, maybe you guys oh, know who Tony yeah, I do. was. And so Tony, I'm, I'm much older than Sam. Tony, so. Tony, he's not much older, but a little <laughs> bit older. Tony was a, was a hero of mine, and he, I knew about Kerner Ray and Glover because they were John Lennon's favorite band, and they were from here, and so I started to listen to Blues Rags and Hollers, and I picked up a harmonica, and I, I bought Tony Glover's uh, Blues Harp book and uh, tried to learn, how, I'm still trying to learn how to play that instrument, which I play it a certain amount um and just live and and on recordings and i my style has been described as oddly (laughs) one-dimensional but but i learned from tony's book and tony used to have a show that me and dave would listen to i'd sleep over at his house when we were in uh eighth and ninth grade and particularly in ninth grade tony had a show that came on uh, kdwb one am station at straight up midnight and he would play Jimi hendrix cream uh, uh, Steppenwolf, you know, things that were uh, cool, yeah. you know, like hippie music yeah. is, is more or less what it was. Yeah. And it was really fun. I, I just related this story after Tony died about he would um, very often, you know, he would start one side of a record because like Wheels of Fire, one song goes for a whole side. Or, you know, he would play uh, electric half uh, upside of Electric Ladyland. But he would actually leave the building and go outside to smoke. Sure. And so at the end of a record, it would just go. Yeah. And then he'd come back. <laughs> and that could go on for 10 minutes. You know, and, right. and, and, and we were just used to it. You know, we didn't know any different. Right. We, we didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. Um, but so we would listen to that every whatever it was, I think, Saturday night into Sunday morning. Sure. Either Friday or Saturday. And so, um, you know, music became more long form. Um, but FM radio is getting back to your question, Jim, is mm-hmm. exactly the reason the commando started. Right. Is by 1975, we hated everything yeah. on the radio. It just sounded like, uh, well, I need to pick my words. Do I have to pick my no, words? No, this is this okay. podcast. We, can, swear we away. can do whatever. It sounded it's, like it sounded, shit. It sounded very, po- <laughs> very poor to our ears. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and what we liked, Sam, was we liked Eddie Cochran. We liked Gene Vincent. And the blue caps, we liked three chord rock and roll, and um, so we. I said to Dave, "Let's get in a band and make that kind of music, lively or, you know, we just wanted to rock it." Uh, yeah. And we called it stripped down and shoved into high gear. Yeah. And uh, so we would do, like, covers of um, like "Let's Spend the Night Together" uh, by the Rolling Stones, but we would just chop it. Yeah. You know and down. Just- down to its very Crush it. yeah 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 and then yep. down to hmm. its, its basic pieces yeah and then reconstruct it in that way and then romp on to the next thing right and we started paying attention to other people that were making that kind of music but nobody was making that kind of music yeah and, and, until 76 when we heard the ramones right. right and we went wow and how did you find so being in YZ, being here, I mean, how was your outlet? Like, where were you finding this? Only one place. We'd, we'd take the bus downtown to Orfolk Joke Opus yeah. and go in, and either Andy Schwartz or Peter Jesperson would play whatever import had just come in. Right. So we never heard the Sex Pistols before, you know, we went down to Orfolk. We never heard anything. Right. right. But, uh, but I remember Andy playing us the Sex Pistols or Roxy Music. Mm-hmm. For the first time, or you know, American music was starting to go that way. Jonathan Richmond, first time I heard him was down at our folk. Um, yeah. Just little, you know, bands were starting to pop up like us around the country. And uh, that being said, we had no place to play yet. There was no, no market for no, it. No right? market. No. So we would like, we were still working for Shone, and we'd go out and play these jobs at like resorts um, in northern Minnesota. <laughs> And in those days... <laughs> the Suicide Commandos. Yeah. I mean... And, and, and eventually I went to work for Randy, and Sue McLean was my actual boss. Okay. And Sue booked colleges, and I booked high schools. 
And uh, at the end of me pitching all of the um, bands that were on our roster, there were about eight or nine of them, to the, always to the principal of a high school or a junior high. <laughs> then I would say, then there's this three-piece band, the Suicide Commandos, that you can get for 150 bucks yeah. instead of 250 or what other right. bands were charging. And the principal would almost always go for that band. And, and and we, to just to, to finish yeah. this, because there, there, there's another chunk to the story, yeah. we would go and play the at wherever it was, Belle Plaine, Junior High, and the principal would come up, just smoke coming out of his ears. It was always a he. <laughs> yeah, and smoke was coming out of his ears, and he'd go, you guys are so loud. They're, this is terrible. Turn down. But the kids would go crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and... Um, there, the first thing on Monday morning, the phone would ring when I came into Shown Productions. It would be that principal yelling about what an awful <laughs> band the commandos were and how they didn't pay any attention to them. And I'd go, I am so sorry. <laughs> this, uh, this, this happens all the time with that band. And I'll make sure I will personally tell them uh, and, 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 reg- and register your complaint. And every once in a while, the principal would go, you know, your voice sounds familiar. <laughs> you sound a you, lot like the guy. You sound a lot like the guitar player in that band. <laughs> and I go, well, we have the same name. You know, he's, he, his name, he's Chris and I'm Chris. Right. Um, and I learned a valuable lesson. Like years later when I was shipping replacements records from out of the warehouse at Twin Tone, whenever we screwed up a shipment, I would go, oh, man, that's Chris the warehouse guy. <laughs> I go. I I gotta go. I'll go talk with him, and we'll straighten this out. Don't worry. I'll give him a piece of your mind. We'll make sure that he knows what you're thinking. That sounds like something he'd pull. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. sure I did. Yeah. So yeah. So, so Chris, I have a question. Crystal Warehouse guy still follows me around. <laughs> you know, Stevie, yeah. we've got Stevie. Crystal yeah. Warehouse guy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> well. Two things. When I was younger, it was the Wax Museum over in Robbinsdale. Mm-hmm. That, that's where I found. So yeah. I grew up in Crystal, and that's where I would go and yeah. find music. And I, you know, and it's so interesting. I mean, that was such a journey to try to find. What, and you had to befriend the people at the at the yeah. record store. Well, you, you know, know, that's that's how Bob found me. That's how Bob found the other two members of Husker Du. Oh, is they were working at Northern Lights, the record store. Oh, yeah, I know on, that. on University yep. in uh, St. Paul, and eventually they hmm. would rehearse in the basement. Just the way that I would rehearse with Tommy and a couple of other people in the basement of Orfolk, and NNB rehearsed in the basement of the Wax Museum um, down on Lake Street. Okay. And uh, my wife ran a couple of those wax museums over the years. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, funny how that all works. Yeah. But, but, but again, you had to go to a place... It- you had to gravitate to a place where like-minded people absolutely were. And, yeah. and and that sense of discovery in those days like you know just just i remember being so thirsty for something new yeah. and you know that's where i would find like black flag or suicidal tendencies and mm-hmm. which which my question is what you know did you guys form your band and the sound before the name suicide commandos or did suicide commandos sort of dictate Help and form music. No, no, no. We went. we were we were a band starting. Um, Steve, the commando bass player, Steve Almas, who, by the way, I was, we're texting each other monk jokes um, from the parking lot. Yep. We like to tell monk jokes or monastery jokes to each other. Okay, you, you know why? Are there any of them clean enough? Oh yeah, the, no, no. They're all, they're all, nope. They're all, they're all clean. All right. But the beauty of monk jokes and monastery jokes is they take a really long time to tell. Like, I can't tell one on right. the, mm. on the uh, podcast here because it would take about 10 minutes to, you know, set it up and, <laughs> and do it effectively. Um, but but uh, And you're doing we, this over text? <laughs> well, he sent me a long text, and I, I texted him back saying, remind me to tell you the joke about the monk who, took, who takes the vow of silence. Uh, and I, I, he gets that it's too long F- for me. 15 minutes of nothing? It's too, no, no, no. <laughs> but, but, but you know how the, you know, the building blocks of comedy work. Sure. There's three of them, and you have to build your three building blocks. So you, and shortcuts don't work. No, um, not to good comedy, no. No, even even to mediocre comedy. <laughs> um, it's like building a house, you know. You have to have a comedic foundation. Now this I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but back to the commando thing, Steve was the second guy that we auditioned for the band. We decided we wanted to be a three-piece, loud, fast band that was going to have this certain style. It wasn't called punk or anything like that. After we came back from playing in New York at CBGB's a few times, it was called New York Rock. 
and we would go out and play with other bands and they would say from new york city and it, that was us yeah um, even though we weren't from new york <laughs> right but but we'd been to new york so that was good enough and yeah. we, we sounded totally different than anything else that was on the bill but after steve joined the band and we started to learn our sets and figure out what we wanted to do Later on that summer, the summer of 75, you know, maybe it was July or something like that, we were sitting around Utopia House, where Dave and I lived, and uh, where the band rehearsed, and uh, there was a, there, in those days, there was something called the Mel Jass Matinee Movie, and every afternoon at 1 o'clock on Channel 11, a, a host named Mel Jass would come on and introduce a movie. And the movie he introduced one day that summer of 1975 was a movie called um, The Suicide Commandos, starring Aldo Ray. Oh, And nice. I said to Dave, that's an exciting name for a band. It, it's right. face-melting. I mean, <laughs> Suicide Commandos. So the first time I heard your name, I was like, holy shit, Suicide Commandos? Like, this is just going to smash through everything, you well, know? <laughs> we, 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 honestly, you guys, we really did feel like we were on a mission from God. Yeah. And we yeah. were. I yeah. mean, we deputized ourselves to go out and try and, re, try and save rock and roll. Yeah. We thought rock and roll had gotten screwed up, or like you'd say in France, fucked up. Yep. Yeah. But uh, they're, so we did our best to try and um, retrieve it. That's really what we were trying save to do. Save it for right. yeah. itself. From the, from the trying, machine Yeah, or trying to save it from the machine. Yeah. You know, and we'd hear those bands like Sticks and Foreigner, and we'd go, fuck. I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, it was just... Like it formulaic was so, and... Well, it just was like so like... <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's just... It was just, very I KQ. Do, I do, You oh, know, yeah. at, that, at, at that point, you but know. The, when KQ started at the very beginning, that didn't exist yet. But because there was this... Because FM came along, and the format was different, and all songs didn't have to be three minutes or less. Right. Two minutes, 50, you know, was the joke in those days. Um, they it's It begat this creature that was... Um, you know, like arena rock or right. something like that. Yep. You know, not right. that that was all bad. No, no. I mean, no, there's not plenty of fans out there. I, like, but I get what you're saying. Yeah. It, it, the sanitization of it or something. The... It just my point is that we were really reactive yeah. to what's going on. Yep. And and that's where the band name came from. And it's we thought it was a good name because we were just on this mission. It, it's is this one of those black name. and white like uh, you know Iwo Jima? Like World War Two type movies, yeah. yeah. Except it's in color. Was it in but, color? Yeah, it's okay. in color. It was shot in Italy, I think. Okay. Um, but it's still a World War Two action picture. Yeah, I feel like I've and, maybe seen it. And and by yeah. the way, my stage name in those days was Sergeant Fury because there were comic <laughs> books, Sergeant Fury and his yeah. Howling Commandos. Yeah, yeah. And so we really protect. You know, we our thing came from comic books yeah you know we we that was sort of our inspiration and the howling commandos right. which um i still stumble across one of those comic books usually online these days yeah and, uh, if you take a look at any of that sergeant fury stuff you'll see that that really informed us sure um, that's funny well i can imagine like like you know <clears throat> hey we've got the suicide commandos coming up i mean like anyone that would would be like God, what are these guys? You know. Well, so you're you're like, you're filling in some of the, some of the earliest puzzle missing puzzle pieces in my mind because, because that late late seventies through the early eighties, like up until the days of carrying around a little yellow tape player Walkman, yeah. you know, the Sony Walkman. Like my early life, this is why I remember riding around with my uncles and their their trucks didn't have. FM radios like I didn't realize when FM came online because it's kind of been there all my life yeah um, but if if it was sometime tail end of the 60s into the 70s whatever uh, they were driving old trucks from before the era of FM radio so every all the vehicles I remember as a really young kid did not have FM radios yeah. except for the most brand new of them and do you guys remember there was a lot more dust hanging in the air. I just remember wooden floors and like when you'd walk into, uh, like when you're when you're saying record stores, I'm picturing kind of old 
unfinished wooden floor warehousey type spaces. Yeah, that's where, what our folk was exactly. Yeah, and and where the mm-hmm. when the lights streaming through the window, you could there's always more the dust, dust in the air than there seems to be now. I don't know. No, that's, that's just true. what that's, I remember. That's quite true. Yeah, and the basements of all those buildings in our cities are all limestone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they're made out of limestone slabs. So like this very building, as a matter yeah. of fact, and and kind of so, almost always wet because yeah. of that. But they would generate oh, this dust in the basement that would seep up through the floorboards. If you guys remember, um, oh, what what was the place over on? Oh, there's so many of them. But uh, I remember one of the venues over um, on the West Bank was that way. There, there was there was dust in there. Um, yeah, I just always remember that. being sort of fascinated looking through that that sunlight streaming in and just all of the different types of dust particles that would be floating around. It seems like that was always the case when I was a kid. So every and place the sun old. was out. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't Chris, when you, only, you only have sunny memories. That's good. When was the first time you guys went to New York? When was the first time you went to New York? Uh, I think it was August of 76. Okay. And uh, that was with the band. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We, we, I had sent a demo to Hilly Crystal, a cassette. And yep. said, we're this band from Minnesota. And we read about CBGBs in Rock Scene magazine. And we knew that it was a place where bands like us played. And uh, so I called them up. You know, there was no internet or anything. So Yeah, and that, that was a long-distance yeah. call, too. <laughs> it was a long-distance call, but dig this. I worked at KTEL Records. That was my first job out of college. And right my, my jo- I, was, I was on something called a Watts line. Oh, I- and a Watts line meant that I would call every Osco drugstore in Louisiana and rack job from a distance. So I would ask them how many goofy greats and wacky Western albums they had in their store. And then they would go <laughs> off and count them. And I would just hang on the Watts line, and then I could hear, I'm listening to Louisiana. And then they would come back and say, well, we've got three of these and five of those. And then if that was under, if that was an insufficient amount, I would reorder automatically for them, and KTEL would send another shipment of whatever it was, Goofy Greats or Wacky Westerns or whatever right. it was they were selling. Anyway, my boss said at the end of the day, at 10 minutes before 4 o'clock, if you want to use the Watts line to call your grandma. I remember or, that term, Watts line. Yeah. W A T T S. It was an acronym for something. Right. I don't know, but he said, "Go ahead. You know, everybody can do that." So I booked the first two commando tours. Yeah. Um, thanks to KTEL Records. Right. Because otherwise, long distance calls, and I do remember this from my youth. Like young, long distance calls showed up on your bill as a pretty hefty. Oh, charge. they were. They were really, oh yeah, my they, parents were not pleased. Deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, they were really. When I was in college, you know, that we had it in the budget for me to talk to my folks. You know, three minutes a week. Right. And, yeah, and that that was it. Right. Um, yeah, so so yeah, changed. it was it was yeah it was an expensive proposition. And so had you been to New York before that? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there, my dad um, sold marine hardware, and so we would go to the New York boat show when uh, okay. I was in junior high or high school. I went a couple of times, I suppose, and uh, so I'd been to New York twice, I think. Sure. Uh, three times maybe. Hmm. Right. So I knew how to take a subway, and I knew how to. Ride the bus and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, and that sort of answers, you know, so you're, you know, that was that was a time, I mean, New York is New York, and it's gritty, you know, which yeah. which adds to that sound, that pop sound. When I was in high school, we were out there, and I, again, it was boat show time, and I was out with my mom and dad, and God bless them, they took me around to look at colleges, you know, which is something like you did in the, maybe they still do it, I don't know. Oh, but, we do it. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we, we looked at a few different places where I might go in the Northeast and traveled around for a few days after the boat show. But when um, they were doing their thing, I would just go out of the hotel, which was in Midtown, and go walking on Broadway. And one night I got robbed. Um, a guy flips out a switchblade, and he backs me into a... Uh, uh, you know, we're right on Broadway and right yeah. in front of a whole bunch of people, but I'm the only guy that can see the knife. Right. And he goes, I, I um, want your wallet right now. And I said, well, let's do this. I, I've got 20 bucks in my wallet. I'll give you 10 bucks, and I won't yell. And then you'll go on your way, and I'll go on my way. How about that? Um, and he did it. Yeah. And so um, that was lucky. That's, that's impressive, negotiating well, with, that's, with a I guy mean, right there. I, don't, I, mean, I no longer negotiate with robbers. but, yeah. uh, but at the <laughs> Just time, in case there's any listening. 
At the time, yeah. At the time, I was so young that I just thought, you know, this wouldn't this guy rather have half of my money and get away scot free, right? Or you know, rather than you know, stop thief and that kind of thing. Right. So, it was a very brief negotiation. Wow. Know, it took about forty five seconds. Yeah. Well, this but, is the seventies, though. I mean, that's the politeness. Civility. Well, I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, no, part. it was that was that, that was, was <laughs> that, those were rough days. That was nineteen seventy one. Yeah. Um on Broadway. And Broadway was still like, you know, their pornography, which right. is why I was out there by the way. Um I was um curious about sex and that kind of sure. stuff. Yeah. I no longer am. But, but, <laughs> yeah, but the mystery's, mystery's gone. gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after you figure it out, it's yeah. kind of like, yeah, okay. But 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 you know, when you're that yeah. it, when oh, you're that age sure. and you're two blocks off of Broadway and what oh, appears to you're be New York, like, I mean, that's like, yeah, yeah, you know, some sort of teenage paradise for uh, sure. So you want to go out and check it out? Yeah, yeah, my folks let me go see Hair too oh. on, a, on another trip by myself. They didn't want <laughs> they didn't want to go along. Okay, but, but I got to do that. So there, Chris, you can go. Do you have brothers or siblings? I have um, one brother now, okay. and I had a sister, and she and my dad and her family were killed in a plane crash. Okay. So oh. there's just me and my uh, and all the kids in her family. So it's just me and my brother and my mom. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, it was. It is. Yeah, it's terrible yes. every day. Yeah, um, yep. life changing and not in a good way. So no. that was that was 1996 when that happened. Okay. Um, but yeah, my brother's around, and yep. and my mom still around. Okay, so when you were out there though, you were you were solo, mm-hmm. and you uh, so they let you and go go see a play. Hair, yeah, right, yeah. And guess what? I wanted to see hair. Naked people, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I I didn't. I, you know, the minute you say this, of course, that's right. Now I, mean, I, 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 know I, that. I was not interested in the music, <laughs> right, whatsoever. But but I was interested in the social phenomenon of it. Mm-hmm. And it was groundbreaking, you know, allegedly for a lot of reasons. Um, I can only imagine it was, in, all of it was intriguing. Sure. How old were you, roughly? High school, um, you say? Yeah, they are, I think for, I think that year, and I might be conflating them, I can't remember, but I think I was 69 or 70, something like that. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's it. <laughs> That's yeah. a cool thing to see. 70, yeah. It was a thing to see. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're, I'm grateful for my folks for letting me do that. Absolutely, for sure, for sure. Well, you two, let's take a let's take a brief break. Okay, okay. It doesn't have to be a long one. Sounds good. All right, we'll be back. Packing for a trip? Let Pack Simply give you a little help by delivering travel-safe products directly to your door in an airport security-safe pouch. Unbelievably easy and surprisingly simple. Make your life easier. Visit PackSimply.com. All right, all right, all right. Need some help with a construction project? Looking for thoughtful design and honest answers about what is possible and what isn't? Kinetic Design Build is a full-service boutique remodeling service, residential and commercial clients in the Twin Cities. Design and build with a purpose. Visit kineticdesignbuild.com to request a consolation. God, I just like... That that one... All right, that one is definitely not going to be mine. <laughs> that could be oh, my favorite. I could s- Want to go on a wilderness adventure with Sam? Or maybe know a group of kids who could benefit from a break from their electronics? Maybe you just need a break from the kids. Visit earthed.org for more information about how to get started. Brought to you by the Andalin app. Preserve your memories, prepare for the future, and share with those you love. Andalin... Ah, shit. Andolin, now available on the App Store and Google Play. Visit andolin.app for more information. Do you have an idea that you know deserves a digital solution? Finding a partner to help navigate the digital design and application building process can be daunting. Mobile Composer, in partnership with Kinetic Legacy, offers forward-thinking design built on a stable and adaptable compliance platform. Visit mcomposer.com or kineticlegacy.us to get started building the solutions of tomorrow. 
enterprise or consumer together, Mobile Composer and Kinetic Legacy offer solutions that work in a language you can understand. Interested in art? James Holmberg... <sighs> Interested in art? James Holmberg is both an artist and an art consultant. <sighs> Let James guide you to an original work that will come alive in your home. Visit jamesholmberg.com to find out more. All right, yeah. let's go ahead. We're going. Are we back? Yep. All right, we're back sure. from the break, and we're here with uh, Chris Osgood. Welcome. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Hey, Sam. Hi, Chris. Hey. We were just, I uh, just was admiring Jim's artwork. Yeah, thank In the you. studio where we're recording this. And, yep. uh, well, have uh, we got a deal for you after the show? I bet you do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say is artists usually give me a nice piece. You know, that's not, well, not, not, I'm well, not, ex- I'm, well, I'm not expected to pay, it a to pay for it. No, no, no. Right. You're, you're a man right. of, of, well, in fact, since you went here. You're a man of such stature that you you uh, have a belt these days. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about a championship belt. <laughs> a championship belt. Yeah. Late in life, as you start shrinking, the belts start growing. That's oh, all, it's, that's it's all I can say. <laughs> I'm, I'm about an inch and a half shorter than I used to be. Uh, and, yeah, uh, it happens. And uh, now this belt is, you know, when I put it on, you can barely see me. <laughs> <laughs> well, those wrestling belts, belts are like, you know, I mean, they're like a. At least a foot, aren't they? Oh yeah. Wow. I mean, okay, I, so. I, I would say fifteen inches. Fifteen so, inches. But that's huge. now I'll have to measure it when yeah. I get home. <laughs> to yeah. be fair, it, it, it you did not, uh, in fact, and we have an Andre the Giant sticker on, on, the, the, fridge. on the fridge here, which sort of that's, brought us into this. But you did not wrestle your way to that belt. Mm-mm. Correct. <laughs> no, that came from the from Minnesota Music Coalition, and, and they named me there. Minnesota Music Champion for 2019. And what's nice about that, and you know, I was just thrilled to get it, it has nothing to do with my own career. It has to do with my efforts to help other people. Yeah. And that means a lot to me. Right. When you were, when you, when you start talking about, so I wasn't familiar, I, I've, I know of the Suicide Commandos, I know the name, I've heard a few things, we got filled in, but the, the people you've taught yeah. That's that's my generation of music that mm-hmm. I that I grew up with. So you still your influence on them influenced me. Cool. Yeah. That's what it's Oh, like. that's yeah. that's a nice way of rounding about. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean it's just true. When you start naming all those names, I'm like, well, I know all of these bands. Like I you know Well, they're I and and for me it was fun because they're after we went up, after we stopped touring and I was around here and I could start doing guitar lessons for people. I, I got to meet a lot, a lot of interesting people. You know, they started to come to me, yeah. like men, women, and children. And then go after that, um, being a producer at Twin Tone for six years and producing all those bands and working with them and then going from there to RCA and Springboard for 18 years and helping all kinds of self-employed creative people. It was interesting. Every day, something... Uh, unusual would happen or unexpected. Of course. And, and the cool part, Sam, about that is other creative people inform you. Yeah. You know, they give you good ideas. And the, at the very least, they inspire you to keep going. Um, but at the very most, they may give you a different way of considering things. Absolutely. That, um, and I'm not talking about stealing ideas from people or anything like that. No, just, it's just, it's, it, it's we talk a lot about or something. You just of, absorb uh, yeah, the yeah. cross pollination of, of things, you exactly. know, of different disciplines, and oh, yeah. so so I do know you as from the springboard yeah. too. Oh, good. So how did you how did you enter into that? How did that get started? It got started for me because I had been at Twin Tone for six years, and I'd gotten to work with all these great bands. You know, starting initially with the Suburbs, then along came the Replacements. Then along came Soul Asylum, then the Jayhawks, then Babes in Toyland, Magnolias, Charlie Pickett, uh, Paul Seabar, and the R&B Cadets, and on and on and on. And I was the de facto, or sort of the fallback producer. If somebody wasn't going to bring their own producer into the studio, I was the in-house, not the outhouse, right. the in-house producer. Yep. And so I just got to work with a lot, a lot of people, and... Uh, some had great ideas, some had terrible ideas. <laughs> um, but the, my thing with all the bands that we worked with is I wanted to make sure that everybody 
um, when we went to work to make an album, everybody learned something and everybody felt happier about their prospects at the end of it right. than at the beginning of it. And, you know, maybe they got something from it. And uh, I certainly did. You know, I, I always would learn from uh, everybody whom I worked with. And, uh, and uh, again, generally positive, you know, right. there. Uh, and uh, always, you know, the, the other thing that I was doing in those days, Sam, was being the executive producer, which meant the clock watcher. Right. You know, there we only had so many hours to crank out an album, and the engineer usually was Steve Felstead, who would work with me. Um, Jerry Steckling was who I worked with for the Tet Noir record, which wasn't a twin tone record, um, but but usually it'd be Felgie and me, and uh, like we took the twin tone mobile unit down to Milwaukee to record the Paul Seabar record, and uh, that's another claim to fame for me because Nick Lowe produced a track on that, okay. and then, then we did the balance. So I always talk about that record, the one I did with Nick Lowe, but right. and I never, he and I were never in the same room. <laughs> uh, although, yeah. I, although we opened for Rockpile one time. Okay. Not, not the Commandos, but uh, L73, a band I played with. Felstead was in that band, as a matter of fact, played bass. And uh, so I met... With L7? L73 was Three. the name of our band. Okay. Not, yeah. not the girls from California. Right. Right. Okay. Um, That's the L7, I know. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, we were L73 from here. Yeah. And uh, they uh, very quickly became better known than than uh, than we were, and and L seven three never toured like the um, Commandos did. Okay. And Steve Almas was in New York by that time, but. Uh, and do you I, know the genesis of the name L seven three? The genesis of the name L seven three is I'm sure they um, they had to say there were three of us, so that's where the three came from, and L seven is um, square. You know, let's not be L seven. The Sam the Sham lyric. Oh, right. Let's oh. not be L7. Come and learn to dance. Because when I was young, I heard that L7 from California, that was ladies size seven underwear or something, is one of the singers. That's what I had heard. That's what I had heard. I have heard. no idea yeah, about I, that. I, our name came from Sam the Sham. <laughs> and, and the line in Wooly Bully is, let's not be L7. Ah. Come and learn to dance. Yeah. Um, Again. So, Very cool. So you. L7. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now I got it. Yeah. He, he made the, the, the it's, symbol. It's oh, yeah. beatnik talk, baby. Oh, <laughs> yeah. A little before my time. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so, daddy <laughs> You can't chatter, hit patter. Oh, geez. My dad. Well, my dad's listening. He's like, no, oh, this God. Is, this is. <laughs> no, that's. I love I it. I love it. I know. I love it. I know they were uh, they were at in right in that generation. So oh, I, been... got, I have to tell you guys a beatnik story. Uh, yeah. there, Let's um, hear it. it. It comes from Dave Ray, who was just my hero when I was a kid, from Kerner Ray and Glover. And Dave, at the time, I I thought was the best twelve string player alive. I still think he probably was at that point in time. And I just was in awe of him. And he called me one day and asked if I would come over and, because he heard I knew how to play uh, Billy Gibbons riffs, some ZZ Top riffs, right. and he wanted yeah. to learn them. And he goes, will you um, come over to my house and teach me some... How uh, old were you at that time? Uh, well, the commandos were, were a few years into the commandos, so I suppose 24, 25. And were you, were you teaching guitar at the time, too? or was it? Mm, I think it was before I okay. started doing it in earnest, but somehow he knew that... I like, knew how to make those noises. And one of your heroes calls you up. Yeah, and the phone rings, and it's Dave Ray. <laughs> it's, it's just like Eric Clapton calling <laughs> right. up and, and saying, will you right. come over and give me a guitar lesson? Yeah. And I, I'm just, I, think was, about it. I was agape. But, but anyway, at the end of the conversation, he goes, yeah, come on over Saturday afternoon and bring your horn. And I go, well, Dave, I, I'm a guitar player. And he goes, no, horn is beatnik talk for instrument. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you square. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, bring the horn. Come over and bring your horn. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I've been it, like, it's loud. shit, where do I get a horn? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> My idol just asked me to bring a horn. So did you go out there and just rip out some ZZ Top licks? Well, not exactly rip it out. <laughs> but, but, and then later on, Dave returned the favor and, and recorded with a band that I was in, and we switched off singing Six Days on the Road, you know, mm. with um, the great Dave Dudley song. Uh, okay. You know, one of the original hit records recorded here in the Upper Midwest at K-Bank Studios, where Twin Tone was. That's where they recorded Six Days on the Road. Okay. And is Twin Tone still 
still going? Twin Tone revived itself yeah. after being moribund for 15 years just to put out the last Commando record. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. they put out Time Bomb. Right, which is your newest. Is this yeah. recent? Yep. Yeah, very 20, recent. 2017. 2017? Yeah. In fact, I've got it. I'll give you guys a, some radio promo CDs. I'll oh. yeah. scamper to the car and, and get them afterwards. Perfect. That would be great. Um, we have, but that being said, we didn't release a CD. We just did vinyl. Okay. Um, and downloads. Yeah, yeah. But we made uh, promo. I, CDs I got it on download. For- <laughs> <laughs> oh, the face! I know, I know. Good I'm face. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, that's okay with me. You know, the, the, we pressed a thousand records and we sold them. So yeah, the you did. You sold yeah. them right away. Actually, we sold them right away. So yeah, yeah. I'm happy about that. I'll, uh, it, I'll yeah. take that. No, that's great. Yeah. That's I mean, great. Yeah, times are changing. Like, they're, they're, you know, the everyone's having to figure though. out how to do all this stuff. Well, we had to figure it out again. I know yeah. that's right. But yeah. we had a lot of fun making that record and yeah. uh, recorded it with Kevin Bow and uh, Mitch Easter um, mixed it down in North Carolina. It turned out well. Okay. You know, we're yeah. happy with it. Awesome. That's great. But what so, were we talking about? Well, well you we were, were talking, talking about, about Springboard, actually, a little bit. Oh, yeah. And, and some of the things that you're, you're working on, some of the things that you've done here in town that people don't necessarily, I mean, they know, but they might not know. No, they are. I mean, most people think of me as just um, a a plank spanker, you know, which which I am. (laughs) I understood that one. Very good. Very, very good. (laughs) Um, And I'm back to spanking the plank. And like the two things that I do mainly now are that and French wine importing. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I I work with with suppliers from Southwest France. Yeah, who needs CDs? Let's get into it. I'll tell, I'll tell you the, and this is, that it's, it's, start. Pardon me, it's listeners. Awesome. This this is really boasting, but there I got goosebumps thinking about it. We after Time Bomb came out, when we released it, we had to do the voiceovers saying you're listening to um, WXBK. Oh sure. I'm, I'm Chris from the Suicide Commandos, and you're listening to WXBK. And you have to do like seven thousand of them. I wish it was seven thousand. Okay. It was it was more like seven. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, that's all right. But I got to record those uh, on my iPad over at, at our French house. And so if you're sitting in a house that was built in 1299. Right. Yeah. In France. And in, in France, and you're saying, this is Chris from the Commandos, and you're, you're listening to radio station XBK in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Right. Um, it's, it's cool, man. Yeah, that's oh, super cool. I, it's I, I, so I can't, cool. I can't imagine much cooler than that. Right. Um, no, that's... And, uh, so that was a thrill to be able to I'm do sure. that. I'm sure. Uh, and each time we go over to that joint in that little town over there in France, that's cool, too. Yeah. We like it, and I just I. Love and you go and do work on it. Is that the deal? Yeah, yeah. You're yeah, you're renovating. We it, toil. Correct? Well, restoring. I mean, the the older I get, the less work gets done every yeah. every trip over there. Yeah. But no, we wailed on it for a couple of years before we moved into it. Well, you know, I, we do construction. Yeah. <laughs> well, so. Maybe you can give me a piece of artwork and come over and <laughs> right. do some work on the French. <laughs> right, right, you have no You've idea they, what, they, what you're in for. <laughs> they, Chris. they they know me well at the lumber yard. I'll yeah, tell you yeah. that, and they know me at the hardware store too. Yeah, right. They just when they see me, I show up with my metric tape measure. My French, oh, you're my French metric. My well, French, you have to. Oui, yeah, I suppose. My French, bien sûr, my, and my French dictionary. <laughs> And everybody gets a hearty laugh when they see me. <laughs> and they are, the, I was working on one room in the house, which got nicknamed the panic room, because every time I drilled a hole in the wall, it would just like <laughs> keep going. <laughs> and, uh, and I would have to get, go back to the hardware store and get bigger and bigger inserts to go into this hole, that was just <laughs> getting more giant um, every time I screwed it up. And so everybody knows that they're going to see me a few yeah. times. How did this whole thing start? How did, how did you find this place in France? And how there, this... that, that started, and then we'll swing back around to Springboard yeah. and talk about that a little bit. But yeah. that started because Adrian, my long-suffering significant other, yeah. and I went to France way back in 84. Mm-hmm. And Adrian worked at Hotel Sofitel. And before that, I didn't know anything about wine. But yeah. she started to turn me on to first French wines, and then she worked at Coca Lazoni after that. And turn me on to, I'd pick her up at the end of the night, and there'd be like an inch of Barolo in the end of a bottle or a... Or Barbaresco or something like that. And so I would start to get a chance to taste these really good wines. And uh, I just got into it. And so in 84, we started to, you know, I knew by that time I, I'd started to be build a collection of mainly European wines. And went around and um, really 
we tasted our way, and I, we were over there for a month in 84. We saved up for two years, and we landed on October 1st and flew home on Halloween, and I went to every battlefield from World War I oh, and yeah. every cathedral. Wow. But the thing that Adrian and I got most stoked about is the Cro-Magnon cave paintings down in southwest France, and we still are oh. really moved by those. Cool. And uh, How we, old are those, by the way? About 25,000 oh, years. Yeah. I mean, it varies from about 18,000 to 30,000. Yeah. Um, but in general... Way uh, predating modern history. And, and yeah, 25,000 yeah. years. Yeah. But, you know, so one could say that was the start of modern history. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because right. somebody somewhere from our tribe left mm-hmm. us a message. Right, yeah. right. And it's still there on the wall. Yeah. And it's amazing to see, you know, we... And that we kind just, of revising those timelines as time goes on too and and understanding better how how sophisticated earlier civilizations were they're quite beautiful yeah and we weep when we go down yeah. in there and it was not all the time but uh yeah we're not cry babies <laughs> but uh <laughs> but we we went down and then the, the that trip in 84 we came up and we went back and did the same thing in Spain a couple of years later in 86. Again, I had to save up money for two years, and but we were over there for a month. And then we did the same thing in, in oh, I'm sorry, it was Italy in 86, and it was Spain in 91. Um, and we just ate and drank our way around and went yeah. to every historical. In Italy, I was on a thing where I was following the lives of the saints. So I wanted to see where the miracles happened cool. and, you know, where people levitated and floated around and mm-hmm. stuff. I still am interested in people that can levitate. But, oh, uh, yeah. But well, that's, they're a, sto- that's a story, for <laughs> story for another day. <laughs> right. But um, with going to Spain, we found ourselves going back through the Cro-Magnon, um, that cave painting area in southwest France. And uh, that's when I discovered it in 84. But they, they had a grape down there called the Malbec grape. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have such a thing here. I'd never heard of the Malbec. They couldn't, in fact, they didn't call it Malbec. They called it Cot okay. um, or Auxerrois. And uh, I thought, this is really good. And I took it back and I talked to some, some people here and uh, God bless Larry at the wine company. He said, if you can pre-sell a pallet, we can, mm. we'll bring in a cow or wine. And so I just started to focus on uh, Malbec at first and then Tanat and then um, Fronton. Or I should say that that's the Negret grape from Fronton. Those are the black wines of southwestern France. But Adrian and I got into it, and there was a point where we were doing thank you wine company, 36 wines from all over France. So we would run up to Alsace and be up in the Loire Valley, and, and we brought in some Loire wines. And I read a book that Kermit Lynch wrote called Adventures on the Wine Route. And it was him going and about how he hooked up with his wine suppliers to start his import company in San Francisco. And when we were over there, I thought, hey, wait a minute. There are all these appellations that Kermit or nobody else is bringing in. You know, like Samur, which is right next to Vouvray. So everybody brings in Chenin Blanc from Vouvray, but I like Samur better. Right. And, you know, I like get shadow appellations that, and that's why my import company is called Vanda Campagna, which means country wines. Okay. Because most of the wines that I represent are in the shadow of more, like Caor has always been in the shadow of Bordeaux. Okay. Um, or Bergerac is still in the shadow of Bordeaux. So anyway, I like discovering those wines. Yeah. And I just like flavor, you know. Yeah. I'm kind of into flavor. Right. Um, and Adrian's a great cook. And, uh, not a day goes by that we don't have something spectacular. And we also forage. So we just ah. had chanterelle that we picked ourselves and a mataki mushroom that I pickled the other day. My um, dad just pulled, I mean, he had a mataki that was that big off of a well, stump I, in the yard. I, I had a particularly huge one, and so I learned how to pickle it. And okay. so I, I um, you know, how they're weird the way they, yeah. they, they break apart. Yeah. But and they have the, exactly the consistency in my mouth anyway ying, ying, of uh, uh, expensive crab, like jungle oh, crab that you would use sure. to make a crab cake or something. Yeah, yep. They have that same texture. So I don't know what I'll let you know in six months what the whether it turned out or not. <laughs> yeah. But I have three jars and they all came from the same enormous yeah, mushroom. They're, they're big. They're like a giant loaf of bread. Yeah. You know, which is how they got their name, Hen of the Woods. Okay. And we were fly fishing. We also fly fish. And we were fly fishing up on the Brule with our Twin Tone pals. We get together with the Twin Tone people every year. 
up there and uh, we started we found some chanterelle and so we put down the fly rods and just started <laughs> picking <laughs> yeah. the chanterelle yeah we'd caught a few fish so we were good it was all good yeah. oh my yeah. god this sounds yeah. beautiful it's, i know it's, it's, it's i mean it it's, really it's, it's, does it's absolutely beautiful and yeah over in france we do the same thing you know yep. we um, forage for sep mushrooms in the fall okay um or gris gray mushrooms in the in the springtime and in the fall and so now we've learned to time our trips to France for when the morel are up over there, right. yeah. as opposed to here, which is slightly earlier, and when the sep come up, and uh, there, which is you know they, they're great big boulet, right. much or boulet mushrooms, and uh, hmm. we find boulets here, and we found some boulets in our garden over there in France last year. Okay. And in France, if you don't, if you're unsure whether a mushroom is edible or not, you take it to the pharmacy. And every, oh, and, every and every pharmacist knows the, mycology, the and there's okay. there's usually uh, a poster up about what's edible and what isn't because everybody's into it. Sure. And so you know we had took it into the pharmacist, and she goes, "Yeah, that's edible." <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Hopefully they're right. <laughs> they're usually right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, well, and, what's the worst could happen? Well, instant death. Yeah. Instant death. And, and that ha- has happened to people in my lifetime. You know, yeah. people eating false morels, for example, the morels that come up in September mm-hmm. that aren't hollow. Right. Don't eat those. Um, Man. Well, he's so, not out eating no, wild I'm not. mushrooms anyway, but my, no, my family not. lives a little more rural. I where grew up where in do you Elk. live? Uh, my, where did they live, I should say? I grew up in Elk River, uh, but my dad's up in Clearwater right on the mm-hmm. Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And he'll hunt mushrooms. You know, not... Not religiously, he's not, but he's gotten into it a little more in the last few years. There, man, we uh, we missed a we missed the morel season here. Okay, this last year, and it was really a good season. Yeah. So why do you go for that here? Well, I mean, if I told you, yeah, I suppose that's to kill you. Yeah, 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 that's sort of like a fishing hot fishing spot. Nobody, (laughs) nobody divulges, nobody divulges their exact yeah honey holes, but. What we do do, and I know that all my morel hunting pals do it, is we all go on to morels.com, and you can watch the line coming up from Des Moines to the Twin oh, Cities. Oh, when they're... And everybody they're checks in and yeah. says, you know, they're growing on the south sides of hills, uh-huh. up, up high and in the sun, or they're growing low in sandy soil. And they come up different places every year. Right. So yeah. you can't... You don't... You go to your, your spots where you've always found them, and sometimes they're there, and usually they're not. You know, you have to go look elsewhere. But 1991, um, we found so many morels, we would fill up grocery bags full of them. And when you get morels, as your dad probably <laughs> knows, you cut them in half, clean out the sow bugs, and then we just dried them out. And we still have morels from 91. <laughs> I, I label them all since I'm a wine yeah. guy. I put down yeah. the vintage, and they're all. And we, when we played at the Uptown Bar, I used to get their giant pickle jars yeah you know the spanish oh, the i mean not, not pickle jars but olive jars yeah the spanish olive jars yeah. yep. so i just punch a hole in the top <clears> and just fill them full of dried morels the morels have to be bone dry yeah to make this work but we just resuscitated some the other day adrian took a, a pork tenderloin and butterflied it and then we did bolites that we brought back from france along with morels that we had dried here and then a bunch of cremini mushrooms too and she rolled it up into a into a roll. Oh, and, man. Yeah. We, we had that with a bottle of uh, Bergerac wine. Mm-hmm. You're killing me, Chris. <laughs> Chris You're sounds killing like me. You're it's so... It's rough life. Well, rough well life. And, and I'm telling you, that's the beauty of the French house, is that yeah. we just we go to the market every day. Right. And we eat a lot of, lot of fish over mm-hmm. there because we're in between the Mediterranean and the, about halfway between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. Um, so oysters and every day and uh, how, how nice. did you find the house out there there um, after the cave paintings and all that kind of stuff yeah there I was at a Christmas party in 1995 and um, I met a woman named Carmen and she goes you know I have I have this house that's called the American house in this little village that's outside of Kaor and I go oh Kaor we liked Fijak, and we thought, you know, maybe we should try and, and live somewhere around or get a house near Fijak. At least we were kicking around the idea, and it's so gorgeous. And again, right, the cave paintings and just beautiful, beautiful countryside. And uh, But Carmen's house was close enough that she said, you know, if you bring a bag of mine over to the house, you can stay there for 15 bucks a night. And so we did. 
and it all worked out. Mm -hmm. And we thought we were drug mules, so we took that bag completely <laughs> apart. But there, there were no. Yeah, I was I was wondering about the bag. And, and, and by the way, we would have taken the drugs on the spot. <laughs> right. Uh, they, they wouldn't have left this country. But but there was nothing in there like that. So we brought it over for her, and we really liked it. And we liked the neighbors, and the neighbors liked us. And one of her original partners from California wanted out. It was six Americans. But a couple, one guy lived in New York, one other person lived in Texas, all Carmen's former boyfriends for uh, the most part. Yep. Uh, another guy from here, two people from California, anyway, six of them. And one of the women in California wanted out because the house was too full of spiders mm -hmm. for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't love spiders, but I don't hate spiders either. Right. Um, Any old house can, is going to have spiders. I can coexist with most spiders. Yeah. Um, and so Carmen offered me her share. And I said, well, Carmen, I, I can't afford the, that share, but how about a half a share? Because I said, we only come in this fall and the spring when yeah. nobody else wants to be there. So it's not going to be, we're not going to be in your way. Right. And, uh, and Carmen said, sure. And so we came in for a half share, which was 1500 bucks a year. I'll share with the general public. Mm. Yeah. And, and for that, nice. we had a pied de in France, you know, a place to hang yeah. our hat. And then about the year 2000, Carmen and her original partner, Linda, announced that they were going to retire to that house. And there are only, we did the math, there's six of us, and there are only two rooms in that house. And we said, if we want to be here for any length of time, we better start looking for our own place. And we started looking in about 2000, and we found this place in 2002. We looked at a lot. We just look in the spring and the fall, but always we could use Carmen's house as a, as a base for that. Right. And, when we got the other house, which is down in our entrepot, a river town, uh, right on the Lot River, which is handy for me because a trout stream runs through town. Mm -hmm. So we can work on our house all day and then put on our waders and You're go catch me. go <laughs> catch fish. Yeah, dinner. Uh, and we, when we do that, swear to God, you guys, we walk by the guys that are playing petanc. Yeah. And every, about, every third night they've got a bottle out there of pastis, uh, which is, you know, that uh, licorice. Yes, um, yep. And so they give us a snort. Yeah, on the, on yeah, the way down yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> down to the river, so it's, it's pretty hard to beat. You know? yeah, well, I can't imagine <laughs> what beats it really. I mean, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty nice. And when you're, yeah, you're, when your back cast is going in the mill pond in town, in between two medieval buildings, and going. In, <laughs> oh yeah. And and right. the, this is key, Sam, and you're catching fish. You know, it doesn't, yes. it doesn't, it doesn't often happen these I, days, but right. at first it did. Um, so that was fun, and we. We've made a lot of fly fishing friends. In fact, I was fly fishing. We were fly fishing on the Dordogne one time, and this guy comes, like, clomping up to me on the big rocks that are... The Dordogne is like the Yellowstone or something. It's a pretty big river. And we were fishing for grayling and for fario up oh, there. Oh, they have fario. grayling? Yeah, they have grayling. Mm -hmm. And I had one on one time, but um, I never touched it. Uh, oh, you've, you've I, not... I saw it. Yeah. And, and the guy, Jackie, that we befriended and took us out, he would catch them all the time. Okay. So. And then, you know, they're beautiful with the big dorsal fin. Yeah, I've, uh, I've guided trips up to the subarctic, and I, I've caught yeah. a bunch of grayling. My dad um, f fished up in the Arctic, and yeah. I would go to his office, and he would have a grayling on his desk. Yeah. <laughs> and the grayling are not big fish. They're little no. fish, but it was so beautiful with that huge dorsal fin. Yeah, and they're these... I mean, they range from silver to iridescent purple and green and, yeah. it, and it runs through them and they they can be darker or lighter but they are absolutely beautiful the one, and stellar the, eating the one on dad's desk was purple and green yeah but the ones that we were catching and jackie was catching are they're silver silvery and there, aqua so. aqua blue yeah, sometimes silvery so. and aqua blue they're, yeah. they're gorgeous yeah but this this is a, a, we're really getting off track but gray, <laughs> grayling, no track. Take, grayling take a really long time to take your fly Okay. They're, oh. not, they're not impetuous like trout are. And if you're a fly fisherman, you know that it's easiest to catch brook trout. And rainbow are the next easiest. And then brown are the next, are, the, are harder. And cutthroats are the hardest okay. in this country. But you know, over in France, they just have brown trout, fario. And they're generally really difficult to catch because French fish only get caught once. Um, I think American fish know that they're going to get released. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. For some reason, they're easier to catch. And, right. we, and we always release them to the astonishment of our neighbors. Oh, okay. okay. So French can't get, fish out. only get caught once because they get eaten when they yes. get caught? Yep. All right. Right. Yeah, they get eaten. That's okay. funny. I, I wonder if, 
if there isn't some sort of collective knowledge in fish too. I'm sure there is. I, yeah. It, I'm, I'm convinced of it. I do so, a lot of fishing. So where did you fish for grayling in the subarctic? Uh, well, the, uh, the Wolverine and Seal Rivers were where I caught okay. the most. And they are where? In the uh, Northwest, Northwest Territories? or No, where? far northern Manitoba, just, just a touch south of Nunavut. So way, way up uh, those trips. So I have a nonprofit called Earth Ed, and uh, I worked for many years at a boys' camp, and I guided those trips. Mm. And I've taken three trips up into the up to Hudson Bay. So one of them from Lake Winnipeg, via the Hayes up to Hudson Bay. Uh, one of them on the Churchill River that ends in the town of Churchill, and then the third one was further north yet, and we started started up just south of the border uh, between Manitoba and Nunavut, and you paddle south for a week or so, and then you paddle another two weeks out to the bay on, on the Seal River, and uh, when you lots were, of grayling. When you were in Churchill, did you meet a guy named Henry Ford? Hmm. There, He's kind of well-known up there. The, I mean, it's a small town, and there's... Uh, I've spent, you know, I've spent probably a total cumulative week and a half or so in Churchill on those three trips. But I've, I don't recall Henry Ford. I've, I flew up with my dad. Okay. My, my dad was had been to the Arctic and would go fishing for grayling and char and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. And yeah. My brother went up with him, and they caught a lot of fish. Do you know them. where they were headed when they went up? They, um, I think Joe Haven, you know, which is out on, uh, and when I went with dad, we flew up to um, Great Slave Lake yep. and Yellowknife, and then we went from there up to Joe Haven, okay. and then from there to Ellesmere Island oh. and Pond Inlet. So we were way up. Way up. Way up. My yep. dad's plane is the only low-wing plane, to my knowledge, that's ever landed on Ellesmere Island. Oh, that's... Because usually it's twin beavers. Yep. But yep. my dad had a Beechcraft Bonanza, and we took that up there, and that was the night we stayed in jail, because <laughs> there was if you're up there... And you stayed at the hotel, it cost 300 bucks. but we made friends with the Mountie, whose territory was bigger than the state of California. Yeah. His oh, territory, wow. one right. guy, was right. all of Ellesmere Island, and he let us sleep in jail, So, uh, which was, which was free. <laughs> free. Yeah. And then we, yeah. we went and paid um, 20 bucks for a shower at the, uh, at the hotel. But, and, and that trip was very, very interesting because it was, I mean, to me, um, it started off being a fishing trip. But um, Dad knew that I was into art and into visual art, and it turned out to be um, nine days with Inuit stone carvers. Ah. Oh, my and, gosh. And we spent time watching people carve stone. And, and I love that. Oh, my God. It there's was, some gorgeous stuff yeah, it was, Churchill. It was thrilling. Mesmerizing, oh, I, I would yeah, imagine. Just, I mean, the whole experience of yeah. being with those people. And we played golf at midnight yeah. uh, one night. <laughs> yeah. with, and you had to go around in the village, this, swear to God, and and um, somebody had a club that they would let you use, and and like three people had golf balls. Yeah. And then you'd have to return the golf balls, and the club, and if your golf ball went down a marmot hole, mm-hmm. it was gone. Don't yeah. don't reach in there for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. I tend not to reach in to any holes in the ground. Uh, it's, it and and all, all the greens up there were pieces of carpeting that the villagers had dragged out and drilled a hole in. And so oh. you were trying to, and everybody just shared a club. I think we had like a five iron or something right. like that. And, right, right. And, and that was for putting too, yeah. by the way. Uh, well, and you're, I mean, you're far enough north at that point that that's all permafrost. And right. Like, I yeah. mean, so on those canoe trips, when we're far enough north, we're in permafrost as well. So it's the middle of July. And it's maybe 80 degrees sometimes during the day. Like, they can mm-hmm. have heat waves. Right. Um, it could be 95 occasionally. But when you set your tent, you put your stakes in. In the morning, you wake up and your stake is frozen on the outside because literally below the surface, about an inch or two is ice. Yeah. Always. So, okay. really, the, really we, interesting. We always got to, we had sleeping bags. And bef- when we were still in Manitoba on the way up there, um, and... What's, what's the town up there? Is it Yellowknife that's on Great Slave Lake? Yeah, I believe it yeah, is. We, stayed Tom- in a- we always go out of Thompson, which is further east. And I think western Manitoba is where Yellowknife anyway, is. Anyway, we stayed in a hotel up there, but that was the one night that we stayed in a hotel. Yeah. Otherwise, we were in a tent, yep. and we had a shotgun um, for the polar bears. Yep. 
and um, which happily we never had to use. I've I've never either, but I've but, always I've carried a gun as well. But um, there, after we got way up there, people would just let us sleep on their living room floor. Mm-hmm. Like when Joe Haven, I remember we slept with some school teachers, and they just let us, you know, there. Oh, for just sure. There, bunk, and people, people were bunk. But what I'm the point? What up. I was going to say is, out the back door of the stone carvers were just haunches of meat, muskox or reindeer. Okay. And yeah. they, if they were feeling particularly hospitable, you would get to a chaw of reindeer or muskox that they would cut off with a ulu knife. Yeah. You seen one yeah, of those? Yeah, yeah. You know, the round-bladed yep. knives? Yep, it's sort so of hooked. They'd, they'd bring a haunch into their house. And by the way, no furniture in their houses <laughs> right. of the, of the um, Inuit people. The, the people from down south, you know, had furniture like we have. But I never saw any beds or anything. Well, you got to... So you're just like on the sleeping bags on the floor. Yeah, but not with those people. We were right. we were with like, you know, Westerners or sure. Canadians. Uh, okay. And a lot of people from, from Nova, Nova Scotia were up there. Right. But when we were in native people's houses, hmm. um, they must have been in the other room. I just never saw. But they would get a piece of cardboard, put it on the floor and get that ulu knife and just cut you off a sliver of uh, meat. Right. right, and it would just sit out their back door, right? Um, and that's that was their refrigerator. Yeah, yeah, and and I assume that was uh, it was raw. When yeah, yeah, it was raw. yeah. I mean, cured obviously because it had been out there for weeks. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's it's all fine, you know. It what's uh, I worked at Filio. What's my carpaccio? Oh, carpaccio, yeah. Is, you know, it's well, like n- natural carpaccio. But I was happy to be able to taste it. And, oh yeah, yeah of and, and it was it was those two things I remember muskox and and uh, and caribou I guess it was yeah not, not reindeer well caribou, caribou. Yeah. yeah yeah so good for you that's mysterious oh I love it in fact we're planning a trip next year 2020 <laughs> you got a big trip coming yeah back up to the Wolverine River uh, it's I went in 2012 was the last time I was up and it's just so incredibly gorgeous uh, we were up there way back in '94 is when this. Yeah trip happened and um before i lost my dad um yeah. and uh there i mean it was just blew my mind so i, I, I have to yeah, share go this ahead. with you guys I, yeah I, you know i was used to going back and forth to france by that time or traveling a little bit in right. europe so I go, I go okay dad we're going up and we're going to spend 11 days in a place where there's nothing to eat no scenery no culture Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it just, it was just so thrilling. So yeah. way beyond. And it blew I, your mind. Oh, it, there, the scenery is gorgeous. The yeah. people are fantastic. Yeah. So the, the deal is with kind of the lack of furniture and, and everything else, whatever, there's just so, there's so few ways to get resources up there. It's, right. it's so incredibly expensive to fly anything heavy up that people end up you know kind of improvising well those big water tanks you know every every house that we were in had an indoor water tank because it would freeze if it was outside yep. and it was just a giant plastic thing and a truck would go around and they'd fill it up with like a gasoline kind of a hose um and it would just make its way through the village and yep. that's how everybody got their water yeah there was just gravity you have your own water tower in your house exactly because yep. with permafrost, there's no such thing as infrastructure below ground. No, you can't. You can't run pipes. You can't. The other thing up up, up there, Jim, that is, yeah. is weird, and I don't know if it weirded you out or if you saw it where you were, garbage. Oh they yeah, you can't get rid of it. Big junkyards of fifty-five gallon drums. Yeah. And we, oh, and, and how how is that stored? Is it just it's piled up? You either you know, burn stuff if it's if it's burnable, burn it. If not, it stays forever. Alaska's a lot that way too. Yeah. Wow. Because just big piles of 55 gallon drums and miscellaneous trash. Right. It's amazing. Yeah, that type of infrastructure. I mean, you think about what it would cost to get fuel and and to have, you know, front end loaders digging pits where right. you can't really dig pits because it's yeah, the permafrost it anyway. Is. And right. then try and bury the trash, all the things that we do here. Right. You can't do that stuff up there. They just don't work. No. The, yeah. phys- work. the physics of it don't work. Yeah. So it just kind of piles up. Yeah, piles. Yeah. yeah, I mean, okay, the, in, which is in, a little shocking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I wouldn't even have thought of that. You yeah, know, how do you dispose of things? Some communities try and be a little more organized about it, and then individuals or communities, some of them, it's just like, no, that's it. There's there's the 
the spot where we just pile all the trash. Right. right. And sometimes you can see the junkyard and sometimes you can't. You know, yep. it's over a little mm. rise or mm-hmm. something like yep. that. Mm-hmm. But circling all the way back around to, <laughs> to Springboard and RCA, and then, yeah. then we'll break this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, um, it was very, very fun for me to learn how creative people such as yourselves see the world. Yeah. Think of the world. Problem solve creative problems. Which, by the way, every creative problem is a problem we've made for ourselves. Right. And that we're trying to solve. Isn't that cool? It, yeah. That, it is. I mean, we talk a lot about that, especially recently here. And, and it, what is interesting is that, you know, we bring that phrase again, that cross-pollination with disciplines. You know, how, how an engineer and an architect and an artist all look at a problem, the same problem, but yeah. approach it and enter it a little bit differently. But if you can pull it together as a collective you know it's an interesting way to solve a problem well and here's another thing to think about is every creative person has a different end result in mind right you know we're not all going for the same outcome yeah you know we don't in our world two and two don't have to equal four right and they almost never do yeah so um to, to me that's quite interesting that's what makes us different from opossums yes who are then, <laughs> opossums are scarier than humans though. Have you ever looked one? Yeah, oh yeah, they're and, uh, terrifying. God, I'm, I don't, I don't like to be around that. No. Uh-uh. Their little faces, little those yellowy little, eyes. What about those little pink hands? Yeah, ah. yeah. No, they aren't. They, yeah, they, yeah, they scare me. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not afraid of any other small mammals. <laughs> right, but, but if those you, little but guys. One of those guys, if you get if you get them in the headlights and they look you in the eye, it's like yeah, ah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Scary thing. Yeah. So you were with. Are you still with Springboard? No. Right. There, my little deal was that after six years at Twin Tone with mm-hmm. all of that, and I left in 1990 just because I'd gotten to work with all the great bands. Right. All the bands that were coming up when I, were, when I was there, aesthetically, we were the same. Right. And so other bands were coming up, not necessarily any worse or, or less interesting, but less interesting to me. Yeah, sure. So I, I, that job came up at uh, RCA, Resources and Counseling for the Arts. Yeah. And it happened in the Landmark Center. And I thought to myself, I'd like to work in the Landmark Center. It'd be like going to work <laughs> in a castle every oh, day. For and sure. it was. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, first we were there, and then we were down in the Northern Warehouse. And I did that for 18 years. And yeah. that was really the bulk of my official career um, as an arts administrator. And from there... I went to McNally Smith College yep. of Music. Harry had hired me and Chan to teach pop songwriting at McPhail. And I'm still technically, and Chan too, yep. we're both still technically um, on the faculty at McPhail. Although we haven't taught a class since Chan started to do those big new standards holiday right. shows. Oh, yeah, you know, those they're, things are... They're so much a better use of his time sure. economically yeah. right. than, um, you know, the economic outcome is way better <laughs> right. than, the, than what well, we Well, yeah, I mean, he sells those out. I mean, those are yeah. extremely popular. They're extremely popular, and, and the, those guys have done a great job of, yeah. um, of turning that into a thing. Right. Um, we used to say when the new standards started, we had another band that, that did only cover songs called the X-Boys, and I would point out to people that Chan and the New Standards are trying to be cool, and the X Boys are trying to be not cool, right. and we're succeeding. Right. <laughs> I say that to Chan every once in a while right. to, to tease him. Yeah. And he and I are still real pally. Yeah. Um, and the, there, so Harry was after me to come to McNally, and I, I go, hey, Harry, I, no, I, this, I have the coolest job. I'm the only director of artist services in the world. You know, why would I want to change that? And Harry goes, well, we'll make you dean of students. And I go, Harry, why would I want to be dean of students when I'm already king of the gypsies? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe the pay is a little better being dean of students. Maybe. The pay was better. Yeah. Oh And, and, And the other thing that that, you know, at my advanced age, that turned out to be a good thing in terms of like FICA payments and sure, sure. And that went on for nine and a half years and turned out to just be a joy, so right. fun. And I got to at the end of it um, uh, start the McNally Smith College of Music stage out at the airport, out at MSP and Republic. That was the last thing, kind of big thing that I did. Awesome. It was, and so we are the third airport in the country to have regular live music after Nashville and Austin. 
Very cool. Isn't I mean, cool? it's very cool. It is. Yeah. I mean, that's what makes the Twin Cities cool. I that, love it. You know, that's what I that's, think. That's, you know, that's another slice of it. Just imagine if you go to work every day and that's your mission. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're, we're living through, I, I feel like there's kind of a resurgence of, of, and maybe it's never gone away. I don't know. But we've had several guests talk about uh, what a great time it was. Maybe when like the suburbs and the replacements and Husker do were, were you could see them at any bar mm-hmm. given around town. And I feel like there's people kind of bringing that back a little bit. Just, you know, inexpensive cover, small band, not very well known. Well, there's a lot of venues in the Twin Cities. I, I think the greatest time in any person's life um, is what the music was like when they were 22. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And that, and that's sort of my, my area. I mean, you know, uh, soul asylum was huge. I mean, I don't think I ever missed a show. I mean, if they were playing here in the twin cities, right. so yeah, there, I, I, the record that I produced of theirs was while you were out, which okay. was in, uh, 86. Yeah. And I remember it was TTR eighty six seventy. Uh, so it was the 70th record the Twin Tone put out. Just like uh, Let It Be was 8441. Came out in 1984 and was the 41st okay. release. Yep. And the, our last record that we did for them was number 403. Okay. And so they've made it up to See, 403 releases. We, uh, <laughs> we have developed this memory preservation app because he and I, neither one of us could rattle off numbers like that. Like I forget everything in life. Oh, so. I don't, yeah, I can't remember anything. <laughs> I, I, I re, every once in a while, I'll pull something out of the hat, you know? And I'll yeah. Be like, he's pretty wow. good about certain things. Yeah. No, every doubt. once in a while. At Twin Tone, I was producer by night and sales manager, um, and label manager by day. Yeah. So I had lists of, in those days, we didn't happen by email. I would call them up. Right. And I would call up all our distributors and, you know, whether it was Systematic in San Francisco or uh, Green World in Los Angeles or Gem East in New York or whoever it was, and say, you know, do you want to re And I would have these lists of, and it would be all by the numbers. You right. Know? Oh, so you got to right. know those numbers. I, I, well, yeah. I, knew, I knew those numbers pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Well, Chris, um, the last, uh, last little bit here, you, I mean, I feel like you've talked I, about well, everything. I feel like we could... Like, sit here and talk well, quite, I know we quite could. a while. Do you want to plug anything before let, we... Let me ask you a question. Yeah. What do you um, fish for grayling with? Uh, so yeah. I'm, Ooh, I'm more a of a spinning question. reel. You're a spin caster. Yep. And uh, I do have a fly rod. Those trips, we have to be pretty careful about weight. So, I mean, you're gone. You're, you're out on the trail for three and a half weeks yeah. with, with, you know, you pack everything. No food, no food drops, nothing like that. So When we were up there, um, a group of canoeists couldn't get back because it was blowing so hard yeah. on the, like, Mackenzie River. I can't remember what river it yep, was. Yep, it happens. And they had to go pluck them out of there, and it was very expensive. Oh, yeah, that's a huge undertaking. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I've, uh, I mean, I've got... Uh, for sure, absolute life and death stories from <laughs> from my leading those trips. I'm sure you do. And uh, yeah, but so I have my fly rod. I do enjoy fly fishing. I have never. It's not caught me the way it catches Fair. some people, but I've certainly done enough of it, and I really do enjoy it. I think. I think if I had a mentor, you know, well, who, it's an art. I mean, everything that you're doing, Chris, too, is extremely. I mean, you're very precise. I mean, you 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 love the art of. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, 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 you do. But, but do, you I, fish, I, I, do you fish with a classic spinning reel ever? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I go up to the cabin and get in the boat with my brother, you know, and we yeah. go out for, he's always casting for muskies and I'm casting for pike or, or sure. largemouth bass up there. And I live in Minnetonka and I just walk down to uh, Minnehaha Creek. Not this year. It's been too high. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's and been too, high all year. too wet, but um, I catch smallies in there yeah. on... on a fly, you know, whenever. Yeah. See, uh, that's... If, if I just want to go catch a fish on a fly... That's so fun. I, I just go do it there. Yeah. And I, there were two smallmouth bass that I caught one year over and over again. Um, and I recognized them. And I bet by the end of it, they recognized me. <laughs> like, they were hey, like, oh, this guy's going to let us go. <laughs> well, I, yeah. And I yeah. named them by then. Yeah. Well, um, one was Roy Smalley. And the, <laughs> and the other one was Biggie Small. Oh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh, man. 
uh, fishing. Yeah, well, but but yeah, fishing is fun. And, oh, but, but, I love fishing. But fish, fishing can be frustrating too. You know, we're of course we're getting ready to. We always go down to the West Fork of the Kickapoo at the end of the uh, uh, season in Wisconsin because it's so gorgeous down God, there I, around Viroqua. And uh, just, I grew up in Madison oh, too. It's I just beautiful. Split my time. And uh, it is beautiful there. Um, but Adrian and I, we, if we haven't caught a fish all morning. We'll go into town and hassle mm-hmm. the Amish people for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Who's been taking all the fish? <laughs> there was this this girl named Lizzie Glick, and I always if we're if it's raining and we're down there on a Saturday morning, everybody's in at the farmers market in Viroqua, and it's a lot of Amish families. And, yeah. Uh, uh, Lizzie is very cute. I always look for her stand and try and buy her preserves. Okay. Uh, and, you know, she was when I first started buying them. She was twelve, and now she's. 14 or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But I was down there last year, and one of the jams that she was selling was pineapple jam. And I said, Lizzie, is this locally sourced pineapple? Mm, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> where, where, where's your pineapple farm? <laughs> right. Yeah. How are you making this? No, they're fun. They're, yeah. It's fun kids. That's and, cool. That's mm, really nice. Yeah. That's good. We've got uh, a big Mennonite community up around... Oh, Bemidji River. and Pennington, oh, where okay. we've got our land and we buy their preserves too. Same same deal. Love it. I, I make preserves. Yeah, we have a Mirabel tree in our yard in France, and um, so I'll pick them. the the Mirabel came early this year, and so we made sure that the person that has the key to our garden opened it up so all our neighbors could go in and pick the fruit. Yep. But if usually the the it ripens the end of September, and I pick it in October, and I make confiture, or jam, for everybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Adrian will make a clafouti, is what it's called, you know, with you just put the mirabelle on there. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's fun over there. So I, yeah. I have nothing to pitch except um, oh, yeah. to hopefully your podcasters do their best to have fun every day. I mean, we're, uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful world we live in. It, it is. is. And it uh, is. Occasionally, like with everything that goes down these days. Right. You know, when you turn on the TV and you just groan and you go, God, I can't believe where we're going and, and what are, our values are like now. You know, what? Mm-hmm. I know. It's, it's like, it's, it's unbelievable. And it, it can be sort of like soul sapping. It can of be. Of course. Yeah. You know, but uh, getting out and taking a good look around um, at nature, uh, number one, and at, I'm a humanist. Yeah. So yeah. I, I like to see humans do well. Yeah. Chris, that's <laughs> a great, I mean, that's a beautiful, it's a beautiful way to say it. I mean, that's it a is. good way to look yeah. at the world, yeah. too. Yeah. It is. I I've agree. I've got a little, a little group I started called Decency Daily, and it's just, I just feel like, hey, let's, let's put down the pitchforks or whatever. Let's, let's not worry about which side we're on right now. Let's remember we're all human, and we're all, we're all trying to make it we're through all this, in it and together. we can do... Yeah. We can be nice to each other. We can just be just a little bit decent every day, yeah. and, and that helps. Let's end on that note. And yes. after you hit the off button, I'll tell you a story. Okay. okay. Chris, well, Chris, thank you thank for you coming so in. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Real pleasure. Yeah. Nice thank to you. know you thank both. You. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. We love comments and feedback, so go ahead and let us have it. If you'd like to learn more about Andalin and other legacy projects, visit the website at andalin.app or kineticlegacy.us. Take care. Mm-hmm.